Oh, hi, I'm the heretic. Turd Flinging Monkey is a YouTuber, obviously. I might have seen one or two of his videos years ago, but I never really followed him, so I can't speak for the quality of his content one way or another. He doesn't show his actual subscriber count, but I suspect it's in the hundreds of thousands. I'm sure he generally makes good videos, though. Almost always on a single topic, however. MGTOW. For those who don't know, MGTOW means men going their own way. Men who forego relationships with women entirely because they believe there is too much risk to their own lives relative to the benefits involved in the male-female relationship. So when this video happened to cross my desk, I wondered why he's going after voluntarism and anarcho-capitalism of all things. Anyways, simply formulating a counter-narrative won't do this justice entirely. So, we'll pick this apart the old-fashioned way. I like the way this video is presented, showing the thesis right in front of our eyes. See the voluntarist logo on the thumbnail? Well, according to the video title, voluntarism is a critarchy. Rule by judges. It's an argument I haven't heard before, and I'm interested to hear some new information, new arguments and perspectives. I am a voluntarist, but maybe he has a logical proof that a voluntary society is unethical, or some logical failure in first principles. I hope you're excited too. Hit it! Hello everyone, this is Turd Flingy Monkey, and today we're going to talk about Crytarchy. Or Critarchy. You're probably pronouncing it right. But if I hadn't heard it from you, I would definitely call it a critarchy. Anyways, he restates the thesis shown in the thumbnail and video title, only more explicitly. That anarcho-capitalism and propertarianism, which is a completely different thing, by the way, are actually systems of government ruled by the judiciary. Um, anarcho-capitalism really is a utopian fantasy. It wouldn't work in reality. If you're wondering if he explains the utopian argument against anarcho-capitalism, spoiler alert, he doesn't. It's simply mentioned and taken for granted, which makes sense since it's not his main argument. But the snuck assumption is very insidious, since it leaves viewers with the impression that it's true without any explanation, logic, or facts to back it up. Honestly, this is the kind of nonsense I expect from the mainstream media. But does the anarcho-capitalism is utopian argument have any merit? First, we need to figure out what utopianism is. Utopianism is the belief that a perfect society that is able to function without strife or conflict is achievable. In order to do this, Every aspect of society needs to be planned along rigid and well-defined codes that dictate everything. Who is in charge, and what power do they possess? How do they come to power? What influence do they have in society, and what ability do they have to make alterations to the system? How are common people supposed to live? How do they work? In what industry are they allowed to work, and for how long? How are children conceived? How are they raised? What time is given to leisure? How much? If this sounds unnecessarily nitpicky, that's good. You're paying attention. Plato's Republic being the archetypal example, Sir Thomas More's eponymous utopia, and Karl Marx's communist utopia, while all three described wildly differing societies, and it's still debated whether they were describing their ideal societies or not, except in the case of Marx, whose ideas were definitely idealistic, they all had the same thing in common. All three were totalitarian autocracies, where every aspect of a person's life, from birth until death, from dawn to dusk, was planned and regimented from on high by their rulers. The rulers often being depicted as enlightened geniuses, Plato's Philosopher Kings, which definitely wasn't a conflict of interest, what with Plato being a philosopher and all. So why did they have all these commonalities? Because the perfect, just society, to the utopians' eyes, is always something that can be predicted, planned, designed. If everyone would just act according to my whims, then a new age of prosperity would begin. Therefore, we can define utopianism 
as his desire for a planned society. Now, what does anarcho-capitalism and voluntarism argue? Do they know how society without a state will function? Can they tell you how many hours a wilder ought to work? How large people's houses ought to be? Of course not. While you could easily find many anarchists who would try to answer these questions, including myself, the truth is that we don't know, as it would become apparent quickly. But the anarchist who recognizes this would have to recognize that the person they're speaking to doesn't know either. In fact, there is nobody on earth who lives or has ever lived who could possibly answer this question. Instead, the anarchist responds that the best way to find out how to answer these questions is for people to voluntarily associate it and figure it out among themselves through trade and competition. Therefore, the anarchist and the voluntarist, though I repeat myself, is an anti-utopian, not a dystopianist at all, don't mistake me. The voluntarist says that there is no perfect plan for society that could ever possibly be derived from mankind, and trying to find it has been the driver for almost all of the misery mankind has endured in the last 5,500 years. Let's be real here. We all have our ideal societies, places we would imagine would be able to maximize our well-being while minimizing our hardship. This is what I perceive a voluntary society would do for me. But to call a political philosophy of any kind utopian just because they have an ideal society is absurd. If you don't have an ideal society, then that is a confession of a lack of imagination on your part. Then again, I don't know why TFM is calling anarchism utopian, since he didn't explain why he said it. ANCAPs know this, and so in order to get around this, they redefine government. So if you talk to an ANCAP, they'll say that a government that doesn't use force or coercion that's voluntary isn't a government. You're making two points here. Either ANCAPs don't believe that our society would work or we're redefining government. Focus, man. The truth, however, I don't have to explain anything. We put forward our definition of government, and it's consistent with the dictionary definitions. The reason we're not using the dictionary definitions is because pinning down the actual, concrete definition is a wild goose chase that often leads people in a circle. Government. 1. The act or process of governing. Okay, so what is governing? Governing. 1. To exercise continuous sovereign authority over. Okay, so what is sovereign authority? Sovereign. 1. One possessing or held to possess supreme political power or sovereignty. God damn it. Political. 1. Of or relating to government, a government, or the conduct of government. Government. 1. The act or process of governing. Ah! It's nearly impossible to pin down actual definitions using the dictionary, so we presented our own that's consistent with classical definitions. Our definition is that a government is a geographical monopoly on arbitration that gives itself a monopoly on coercion. Something all governments possess, as they only allow their arbiters to adjudicate on matters of legislation. Similarly, they retain the exclusive right to the initiation of force, which they use to enforce their monopoly and is necessary for their very existence. We know this because they're funded through taxation, which means that without people being compelled into funding them, they wouldn't do so voluntarily, meaning nobody wants it. A general statement, obviously. I'm sure some people would voluntarily pay for the state if so asked, but it would hardly be enough, wouldn't it? Even if there were enough, an organization that is funded through voluntary transactions that provides goods or services, it's not a government. That's a business. We're not redefining words. We're using them correctly. Also, are you going to provide any proof that ANCAPs don't believe in what they talk about? You obviously know this isn't true. Otherwise, what's the point in discussing it? So basically, ANCAPs admit you're going to have a government. 
What did I just say? A government is not a government if it is voluntary and therefore non-coercive, unless it's your argument that an organization can be both a government and a business. As I said before, the burden of proof is not on us. We've given our definition, and you have failed to define your definition of government. It cannot be the ability to make rules, since literally anyone can do that. Rules in an area? Again, any property owner can do that. A swimming pool at a gym is not a government, even though they have rules in their area. Most places of business have them, and they're recognized even by our modern status society. You'll be sent to jail if you squat down and take a dump on someone's floor. So what is Mr. Flinging's definition? He doesn't give one. He just mentions a 2005 article titled Crytarchy from Voluntarius.com and doesn't discuss it at all, just leaves the headline there. He never mentions any of the ideas discussed in the article, such as polycentric law, private police, natural law, or any of the other points brought up. I have my own problems with that article and propertarianism in general, so I'm not going to defend it or refute his arguments against them. The only time he actually discusses the article is in reference to one paragraph. Now, I'm skipping over a lot, but TFM does a lot of conflating propertarianism and voluntarism together, and so far has done nothing, nothing, to prove that voluntarism would be ruled by judges. This is very important for his thesis, and without this connection, his arguments against Crytarchy are just hot air. The only connection made so far is one article on one website. It would be one thing if you had passages from the many works of Samuel Konkin, Lysander Spooner, Murray Rothbard, or David Friedman, or hell, there's ANCAP or voluntarist YouTubers you can source. But no, you picked one article from one website and assumed it must be what every voluntarist believes. This is absolute intellectual laziness, and quite frankly, Mr. Flinging, you should be ashamed for putting this in front of your audience. You didn't do any research into what we actually believe, and it shows. I might not have shown any clips, but trust me, I don't need to. The full video will be in the description if you want to see it for yourself, but I am watching this video, and I got eight minutes into it. And you know what I did not see? Any mention of natural law, the non-aggression principle, first principles, things that are ANCAP 101. I can only assume your exposure to voluntarism comes exclusively from your cherry-picked article, but that can't be right, because natural law is mentioned by name 13 times in the article. Furthermore, what it was actually discussing was polycentric law, but TFM never addresses that. I know the article reads like it was written by a Hoppian, but did TFM even read the article? Or did he just glance at the title and started recording a video? I've explained how lot and order would work in a voluntary society in previous videos. Now does that mean it is impossible for some free market judicial system to emerge that results in these judges exercising arbitrary political authority? Of course not. Again, the premise of voluntarism is I don't know and nobody else does. But I haven't seen any convincing arguments as to how the incentives created by a free market, competition, and supply and demand would result in judicial autocracy. For me to assume that it could happen would be irrational, because in a free market, the only way for judges to become rulers is if consumers would want them to. Any judicial system that a stateless, voluntary society creates is one that puts the customers forward first and foremost. So these comparisons that TFM is creating in comparing voluntarism to the Ninth Circuit Court of the United States Judicial Branch is absurd. It has no rational basis in the logic TFM himself has presented. It simply appeals to people still suckered in by partyarchy, even though both Republicans and Democrats work in the interests of the state. This can be proven by simple observation, as both parties' proposals 
inevitably involve some form of government coercion. Also interesting how dead set Mr. Flinging is against Crytarchy, even though that's exactly what a state is. All states. A single, all-powerful entity that only allows itself to adjudicate in its area and violently enforces its jurisdiction. His criticism of Crytarchy is Sargon's law in action. The fact that legal authority is subdivided among numerous branches or there is a pretense of checks and balances means nothing to the presence or absence of a monopoly on arbitration. By now, I've made my point, but he says this eight minutes in. America didn't fail, it became a democracy. America was founded as a republic. But then, slowly but surely, the people, the left, they corrupted the institutions and made them more democratic until now we essentially have a democracy. So it's not the existence of a violent, coercive monopoly in the hands of a ruling elite that's the problem. It's our fault, you see. How dare we not conform to the glorious vision of our founding fathers? Never mind the fact that it was the elite who wanted this in the first place and agitated for it. You said it yourself in this video. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Even if your theory is correct, and it's the people who screwed up, and not the incentives that a coercive monopoly make, that inherently select for the worst people in society to join it, it still speaks poorly of your overall system that it can be so horribly altered by a corrupt society. As Lysander Spooner said, either the Constitution has authorized the government we have had, or has been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. If you want to avert this problem, the people must be prevented from having any input in government at all, and the leaders must be selected from a foreign population. However, there is no difference between this and imperial despotism. If it's the people's fault for corrupting the government, then it's irrational to restore it to the system that purports itself to be of, by, and for the people, isn't it? It's like turning on a space heater next to an ice sculpture and then blaming the sculpture for melting at high temperatures. In that the republic itself was flawed. A republican system is still the best system in my opinion. When we're dealing with systems of societal organization that affects thousands, millions, and even billions of people, and can often be the determining factor between mass famine or literal freaking immortality, your opinion isn't good enough. Back it up. Though he's quite inconsistent in his beliefs, his position from this video is that the United States needs to return to 100% Constitution compliance prior to the passage of the 11th Amendment. Yet in his video, UBI is inevitable. He states his support for universal basic income to prevent people who might be kicked out of their jobs in the future from rioting. If whether or not people will perform an undesirable act is dependent on your giving them stuff, that's not good. That's extortion. But the Luddites will riot and burn stuff. That's just the special pleading fallacy. It's still extortion. While this isn't actually that important, for TFM, it's critical. UBI does not exist in the Constitution. Nowhere does it say that the federal government is authorized to give money to people as a condition for being alive. What he is advocating for in this one instance is an unconstitutional act, in addition to an economically disastrous one, as being given income by the government is a direct subsidy to people not to work, and will result in prices going up to compensate. But here's the thing. turd thinking monkey, you don't know what anarcho-capitalism is, you don't know what voluntarism is, and you definitely don't know what propertarianism is. If you wanted to branch your content out, instead of just being stuck as a skeptic from the culture war five years ago, great. But you lie to your audience by presenting yourself as an authority on these topics, and it's obvious. There is a grand body of work on libertarianism, anarchism, Austrian economics, 
books, lectures, journals, YouTube videos. You aren't interested in any of it. You aren't even curious. You didn't even bother to read one article. My advice, stick to what you know. But I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, TFM. You clearly weren't interested in this topic, and you clearly didn't want to make a video about it. So my question is, who put you up to making this video? Who did you shill for to make this video? Questions? Comments? Critique? Do you think Turd Flinking Monkey has a point? Is TFM a paid shill? And if so, who's paying him? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.